I am Don Fish, farmer from Maynard, Iowa, in Fayette County. I don't like the present farm program. I would like to see it changed. I'm Oscar Elaine of Marcus, Cherokee County, Iowa farmer. I rather like the one that we are working on at the present time. WOI-TV, in cooperation with the Iowa State Extension Service, presents Down to Earth. With Dave Bateman. Good evening, and welcome to Down to Earth at its new time at 7.30. Tonight we're starting a new series of programs on public affairs, our public issues. And we think that you'll be interested in this uh, series of 11 weeks that we plan to run. Now we only have a few minutes here because the program is long and varied to tell you something about what's going to be happening for the le next 11 weeks. So let's get on with that now. Let me tell you about the four broad areas that we plan to cover during this time. Farm price and income policy will be one of our major areas. Another one which I know that you'll be interested in will be avoiding depression. And then we'll discuss international trade and American foreign policy. Now, it'll take us 11 weeks to cover those four areas, but we're only interested in the first one tonight, so let's think about it for just a minute. The, uh, the first one is very important, the farm policy, farm price and income policy, rather, because in it, we're going to discuss the, uh, for the next four weeks, some things in it. In fact, we're going to be discussing tonight which is a part of this uh, number one farm price and income policy, shall we change the present farm program? And then on January the 14th, we'll be discussing goals for American, for the uh, farm, goals for a uh, farm price program. And then on January the 21st, we'll be uh, discussing methods of price and income support. And on January the 28th, farm price supports the issues and the choices. Now then, you heard those two gentlemen a minute ago say that they were for and against the particular issue that we're discussing tonight. Those gentlemen are farmers here in Iowa, and although you have met them, I would like to introduce them to you again and tell, them, tell you a little bit more about them, at least let you get acquainted with them again. Mr. Don Fish of Maynard, a corn and hog farmer, and you definitely heard what he said. He wants the program changed. And Mr. Oscar Helene, of Marcus County, of Marcus in Iowa, Iowa rather, in Cherokee County, a livestock farmer who says he wants to keep the present program. Now these two gentlemen definitely have good ideas and you'll be hearing more from them as the program progresses. Over here we have Boone County residents who form our panel for tonight and certainly you'll be hearing more about them before the program is over. And our moderator for tonight is Mr. Wallace Ogg, extension economist here at Iowa State College. And definitely, you'll be hearing a lot about the program as it proceeds. So, Wallace, here it is. We're going to talk, uh, Dave, about the present farm program and whether it ought to be changed. We better think about what the present program attempts to do and uh, how it attempts to do it, and then a little bit about the situation at the present time. Now, if we want to know what the present program attempts to do, we have to go back to the 1938 law for the goals. Uh, in the 1938 law, there are three goals set out, conservation of natural resources, a steady flow of uh, commodities to consumers at fair prices, and then the last one, parity income and parity prices for farmers. Now, this, it's this last one that we want to talk about tonight, so we'll put it up here and, and go on with this. Parity prices and parity income are the, uh, is the goal that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, this uh, parity word is one that some people worry about. Let me just take a minute to uh, explain it to you. Parity is a relationship set up by law that attempts to make a fair relationship between farm and non-farm prices. Now, take a commodity that you're all familiar with, corn. We use the 1910 to 14 relationship to establish this fair price. 
the present law establishes 90% of parity as the support level that we're going to try to maintain. Now, 90% is for the basic commodities. Corn, wheat, and cotton. Uh, rice, peanuts, and tobacco. Now, there are some other commodities that are also supported at 90% of parity, and two of them that we're familiar with here in Iowa are dairy products and wool. Now, this is what the present program attempts to do. Uh, now, what are the methods that the present program uses? The methods are, first, uh, loans with storage. You're all familiar with the corn loan program. Uh, purchases with storage, such as we have in the butter program. Surplus disposal when it's necessary, such as we also use it with the butter program. Now we have uh, production control for uh, definitely for wheat and cotton mm. next year. Now these are the, uh, the goals and the methods. Let's look at the present economic situation. At the present time, there's no unemployment to speak of, and there's no shooting war in progress. But prices of farm products are at the lowest level in relation to non-farm prices they have been for uh, since 1941. 91% of parity. Government stocks are large. At the present time, the government owns two and a half billion dollars worth of commodities and has under loan an additional billion and a half dollars worth of commodities. Now this is equivalent to uh, well, two and a half billion dollars is about the value of one crop of wheat, and four billion dollars is about the value of, of uh, our one year's corn crop. Now, why are prices down? Uh, in the last two years, we have lost about a third of the export market for wheat, and about uh, half the export market for cotton. Now, if we took the, the uh, labor and the land that are being used for producing uh, wheat and cotton, and put those into livestock feed, we would increase livestock output roughly about 5% more, which would certainly have some influence on prices too. Now, these are the, the goals, these are the methods, and this is the present situation. And we have in our studio tonight uh, uh, Carl Malone, my colleague, and I'd like to ask Carl, now do you think this represents the, the uh, present situation and the present program? Yes, Wallace, I think you have correctly described the situation. We are in a period of prosperity. We have too much production in agriculture to supply the markets. It's bearing down rather heavily on farm prices. We are building up stockpiles of farm products in the hands of the government. And we have a program to support farm prices for a good many commodities at 90% of parity, and that program is in rather large-scale operation. Yes, Wallace, I think you have correctly described the situation and the problem that is before us. Well, Don, uh, how about you? Is that, are you satisfied to work in this framework? Okay with me. And how about you, Oscar? <coughs> okay. All right, now, uh, uh, Don, you said you wanted to change the present farm program. Uh, tell us why. In the first place, I would like to make it clear that I like high parity prices. I like 100% uh, parity income, if you please. But I think that in the long run, you have to get those prices in the market. I don't think you can legislate them. Therefore, I do not like the present farm program, because for some commodities all the time, and for other commodities some of the time, the government supports are at a high enough level that neither the United States markets or the world markets will absorb them. 
Consequently, the government will either take a huge loss, such as in case of perishable products like butter, eggs, or potatoes, or the government held surplus will become so large as to become unmanageable and possibly to cause the whole program to break down. Or the other alternative, that we'll be under government regulations as to production so strict that neither you nor I will like them. Uh, I think free enterprise in the farm will be largely destroyed and the, to say nothing of the high administrative expense. And I also want to emphasize that I do not believe that price in itself is the yardstick of the immediate well-being of a producer of a certain product. That is, the, the price of a bushel of corn doesn't mean how well off a corn producer is. A price is also, and don't forget this, it, it's a regulator of consumption, which we're very much interested in, and it's also a guide to production. Therefore, high support prices are ten, tend to discourage consumption and to encourage further production, neither of which are advisable. I think that's all I'll say at the present time, Wallace. Um, all right, uh, um, Oscar, now you said that you wanted to keep the present program for the time being at least. Uh, why? Well, basically, the present program has worked well. It has provided farmers with protection from uh, the fluctuations of the free market, yet the farmer has had the freedom to sell instead of to seal if he wanted to. It has served the nation well. Reserves of grain have proved invaluable in time of war and short crops. Nothing better has yet been presented. The basic problem of American agriculture is its tremendous capacity to produce, and the only way farmers can be protected from market declines in the face of this is through a system of fixed price supports and acreage controls when necessary. Industry cuts production to maintain profits, and agriculture has a right to do the same thing. I think we've all uh, noticed recently the way in which uh, many of our big industries have cut production, whether it's John Deere, International Harvester, um, automobile uh, firms, and uh, others who have tried to meet uh, their needs by uh, the production route. Flexible supports uh, won't do the job. The argument that lower price supports will result in less production just doesn't hold water. From 1929 to 32, when prices were lower in each succeeding year, production in each succeeding year was higher. When a farmer knows or believes he will get a lower price per bushel, he is going to produce more bushels, if he possibly can, to keep his total dollar return as high as possible. That's only common sense. We do recognize certain improvements can be made in the present program, but let's not destroy the basic program. Twenty years of experience have pointed out some flaws, which we freely admit. To improve, but not destroy, the present program, we suggest these things. First, to establish a definite reserve policy. And uh, by the way, the president today did indicate in his message that uh, he did want to free and set aside um, some of the reserves which are now present, and also that acres taken out of production could be kept out in order that we might conserve the acres which were out of production. So uh, some of the things probably will be done which are necessary under the framework of that which we have at the present time. Uh, let's make acreage allotments stick. Provide that if the farmer does not comply with acreage allotments, when they are in effect, he will not be eligible for price supports for the following three or maybe five years. In conclusion, let's not apologize for what help the farmer receives from the government. There's no need to, because what is good for the farmer is certainly good for the nation. Now, Don and, uh, and uh, Oscar here both have been mentioning this business of uh, flexible prices and uh, uh, rigid prices or fixed prices. Uh, Carl, I wish you would uh, uh, talk to us just a little bit about what these terms mean because I think that folks will, will understand where we're going on from here better if you uh, have uh, uh, given them a little explanation of that. Well, the fixed price support idea, which is now set at 90% of parity, says that this 90% level is fair. It is fair for a smaller than normal supply. It is fair for a normal supply or it's fair for a larger than normal supply, and in every case, the price support level should be kept at 90% of parity. Now, the flexible idea says that the price should vary depending on the size of the supply. 
Now, there are different versions of this, and this is one version, is that if the supply is below normal, you'd have a 90% price support. If the supply is normal, you'd also have a 90% price support. If the supply is 10% above normal, an 85% of parity support. 20% above at 80% parity. 30% above, 75% of parity, which would be the minimum support level. Now, if you apply this particular kind of a parity idea to corn and to butter, which we produce here in Iowa, the 90% price support at the present time, U.S. average, is $1.60 a bushel. If you had a 10% above normal supply or an 85% uh, support, it would be $1.50, a 20% a above $1.42, a 30% above $1.33 or that would be the minimum support level, U.S. average. Or if you take butter, it would be 66 cents a pound at 90% of a normal supply, 10% above would be 62, 20% 58, and 30% it would be a 55% or 55 cents a pound or 75% of parity price support level. In other words, the price would vary according to the supply. As I said, there are other versions of this, but this is the general idea of flexibility in the support price procedure. I think that is the way it stands, Wallace. Thank you, Carl. Now, uh, are you all satisfied with, uh, with this description? I think you talked about fixed prices first, Oscar. Do you want to modify it any? <clears throat> well, uh, the comments with regard to the percentage is interesting because uh, uh, the goal really is 100% of parity for the farmer. And actually the support price is 90%, which still leaves us a way to go. And normally if we had less than a normal supply, we would probably get the 100% or more of parity. And if we had a more, uh, a more than normal supply, it would be less. But um, uh, actually that has happened in um, this year's market of corn. We've had a situation where the free market price has reflected pretty much the supply. And so uh, uh, it occurs to me that if you didn't have the support price, which takes off the greater margin of the supply, uh, we would have had a much lesser price for corn than we enjoy at the present time. Uh, I'm still buying corn at about um, uh, 10 or 12 cents below the support level. Uh, even though much of it is eligible to the support. And so if we were thinking in terms of uh, trying to get 100% of parity, we do need the kind of support which is now available. Well, uh, Don, it sounds to me like Oscar still believes we need uh, uh, fixed support. Now, do you want to modify the uh, statement Carl made about flexible supports? Is this all right? Uh, I would like to add just a little bit. I think that uh, one of the things that we need is a, a commodity by commodity review. I would agree that for the time being at least 90% supports aren't so bad for corn, but when you have 90% supports for corn, what are you going to do uh, about dairy products which are being produced in great surplus? And what are you going to do, uh, and we have no acreage controls for dairy uh, products that I know of, Oscar. What are you going to do about uh, a wheat which is uh, <coughs> greatly in excess, and cotton. Well, now, just a minute, Don. Um, as I understand your position, and you're, you're saying that you really want to uh, uh, flex prices down to uh, the uh, free market level, but you want to use supports as a kind of cushion to get down there. Now, is that right? I think that support prices need to be, uh, we need to have them to iron out the year to year and the in the year fluctuations we have, but I don't think that you can support them permanently uh, uh, above the price that they will move in the market. And, and you're saying then that we, we use them simply as a cushion to get down to free market prices? That's right. All right, and Oscar, you want to uh, uh, keep support prices, even if it means uh, uh, transferring some income from the rest of us to farmers, at uh, the 90% level as a minimum, and you'd like to see them, of course, at 100%. Now, is that uh, your position? <coughs> Uh, so long as we're living in a uh, at, in a in an era of administered prices in almost every other area in this country, I don't know why that agriculture should be the one who would suffer to the prices which would be fixed 
by the competitive route. <clears throat> it seems to me that when you look into the uh, uh, and, and notice the prices and the subsidies and the support which is being uh, uh, provided to almost every other area of our economy, uh, I'm not ready to uh, lose any of the present supports until and at such time that other segments of our society are willing to do likewise. Agriculture today has a tremendous uh, amount of what um, you economists might call inputs, but the things today that we have to purchase to produce our agricultural production is so much greater than it used to be that unless we do have production uh, on the products which we produce, we aren't going to last very long unless we're willing to establish a much lower standard of living. Now, I would mm -hmm. like to come right in there. Uh, I think that 70% perhaps, or 75, will also give us uh, the kind of, of protection that we need. And, but however, it looks foolish to me. It looks uh, uh, like we as farmers are cutting our own throats if we have a, a product that we're producing uh, 30 or 40% in, in excess. To go right ahead producing that product, I, I think the price should be low enough if, if that's one of our inefficient uh, parts of agriculture that we shift our resources. And I don't think you shift them when your prices are high. For instance, in, in our area, uh, where we uh, milk cows and, and make butter, uh, butter prices uh, are high enough and have been high enough that uh, most of our, nearly half of the people that ordinarily eat butter are eating only. We have priced ourselves right out of the market. The government has been in the market with a high price support program. They have lots of butter in storage. And within the last year, there has been absolutely no shift out of dairying. And certainly, at least some of our inefficient dairy producers should have gone somewhere else. Uh, gentlemen, I, there's a, I have to stop you here because we've got to give these people over here from Boone County a chance to ask them questions. Now, there, there's some questions I'd like very much to ask you. I'd like to ask Don and have him answer uh, just how he thinks other farmers would go along with him. And don't take time for this because we'll let these people ask. The question I'd like to ask you, if we had time for you to answer it, is... Uh, even though other industries do this, do you think you really can make it work for farmers? Now, don't answer it, because I want to give these Boone people a, ch a chance to really ask the questions. Would you folks uh, have some questions you'd like to ask either Oscar or Don? I'm a businessman in Boone County, and I'm wondering, in regard to uh, the conditions, we, uh, we ask all people to vote. We expect them to vote. And if we ask too high a price support, on uh, farm commodities, what is going to be their reaction then in regard to their own affairs later on when they are asking for government support, which they perhaps will do? Which man would I you like to ask? I to you? Mr. Helene, please. Well, if I get your question correctly, are you worried about the, um, the uh, consumer or uh, the business person who is asking for subsidies? I, I would say that it would, uh, it would be as to both parties, both to the consumer and to the businessman. It's cooperation that we're really seeking, and if we ask for too much, I wonder if we will reach that cooperation that we will need. Well, of course, at the present time, so many segments of our society do have protections of various kinds, whether it's in subsidies, tariffs, uh, supports of various kinds, like the uh, uh, mail, the uh, uh, ship subsidies, for instance, railroads, the airplanes, oh, we could go on and on, uh, all kinds of areas in which there is a very definite uh, support. Now, I take it Oscar feels that, uh, that we're not uh, the only ones that ask for support then. Uh, another question? I'm a farmer in Boone County, and I'd like to know if there isn't a possibility of us pricing ourselves out of the world trade market. We export a lot of goods, and I wonder if uh, by high prices, if we might not price ourselves out of that market. I take it he's addressing this to you too, Oscar. <clears throat> I would agree that we probably would price ourselves out of the market, but that's the reason the present law provides that we will produce the amount that we can consume at whatever market is available, both domestic and foreign. And there are times when we have needed all of our production for both domestic and foreign, and when we can't uh, uh, use, utilize all that we can produce because of our ability to produce large amounts, it seems to me that we just have to do exactly like business does, and that's to curtail the amount of production. All right, is there another question? 
I'm a housewife. If um, we get these flexible, flexible supports, uh, Mr. Fish, how long would it take before the housewife realized a difference in the price of clothing and food? John, she's asking me a question that I frankly don't know. Uh, I think that uh, you must realize this, that under flexible supports, we wouldn't go very far down. I think maybe Oscar has led you to believe that we might go clear down to the 1929-32 period. I, I don't believe that. 80% uh, isn't very much lower than 90%. There wouldn't be very much passed on to the housewife, and I think it might take a little while for it, it to get there. Other questions? We've got time for about one more. We have a surplus of wheat uh, in our wheat area. Uh, due to high prices, it is uh, soft wheats, as I understand. Uh, what we need is hard derm wheats, uh, something that will be used for uh, household use. Now, who do you want to uh, comment Mr. on that? Uh, under the, <coughs> under, under the uh, present sure. law, you can uh, pay premiums for production uh, so that you could shift the uh, crop. For instance, during the war, we added flax to the list at a high price. And we can do the same thing, I think, with the wheat crop question that you're raising. Well, now, as I understand the, the two participants on the panel here, Mr. Fish wants to uh, uh, have flexible prices, get us down to the market level. And uh, Mr. Helene here uh, wants us to stay at the high, uh, higher level, the 90% level. And this is really the issue between them. Now, uh, uh, I think that you folks will have to consider this issue, and uh, I will uh, sort of pass it on to you now to make a decision on these things, talk it over with your neighbors, and uh, uh, Dave, I think uh, we hope they will do a good job of it. Well, thank you, Wallace. Now, what do you think about this situation? Are you for the present farm program? Would you like to have it changed? Do you like 90% of parity? Do you want a fixed parity program, or do you want a flexible parity? We didn't intend to try to answer all the questions for you tonight, but we do hope that we challenge you to do some thinking for yourself. By the way, Jim Davis tells me that there are several hundred listening groups in 22 counties in this area listening in tonight, and we certainly want to welcome them and uh, hope that we will have plenty other uh, to get in in the near future. By the way, in the 11 weeks, you know, we're just getting warmed up and getting our gloves on, so we have all this uh, to uh, look forward to. Now then. If you aren't clear on anything, why don't you drop us a letter? Drop me a letter. I'll see that these fellows answer this question for you. Whatever the question might be in relation to this subject we're talking about tonight, you let me know and we'll get it answered for you. Another thing, if you have any questions in your mind, why don't you go to your county extension director and ask him for a copy of What's Next in Farm Programs. It's a bulletin. It's a reprint from Farm Science number 513. If they don't have it, they'll get it for you. So your county extension director certainly would be glad to do this for you. By the way, he'll help you tell you what to get into, what listening group is available for you to get into, so you'll be sure and get into one soon. And remember that we'd sure like you to write us a letter and let us know what you think of the program and give us some idea of whether or not we're reaching you uh, with the programs that we have in mind tonight. Now then, next week, next week we're talking about goals for farm price program. So be with us then next week at that time, 7.30. Good night. This program was produced for the Agricultural Extension Service by Dave Bateman. Directed by Joe Adams. Technical Director, Vernon Casper.